Nice shirt, Chandler. Thank you. Yeah, Justin, he's both of our friends. <laughs> uh, we are going to continue on a, uh, on a thought from last week. Uh, as I was looking at, at, at putting the lesson together last week, I actually had this thought ahead of time. And I thought, a thought, I thought a thought that was, I, I saw a connection, I should say, between, um, between some passages of the Bible. Um, and so as I was looking through the seven women that saved the world last week, and we were in uh, uh, Exodus, and we were looking at the, these women in the first couple chapters of Exodus who saved the world, essentially saved Moses' life, and, uh, and led to the saving of Israel, which led to the saving of the whole world through Jesus. Uh, there was another, another guy who had his whole life saved, from some women in the Bible. And it was, uh, you know, there's definitely a connection. When you look at uh, what the New Testament says about who Jesus is, you notice one thing that definitely stands out. Uh, he is this new prophet like Moses. If you go back and you look at uh, the, the prophecy in, uh, I believe it's Exodus 18, or Exodus, Deuteronomy 18, there's this reference that there will be a new Moses who comes, right? And um, all throughout the Jews and Israel's history, they had taken that and tried to understand what it meant. And, uh, and we've looked at that a number of different times before. But then Jesus shows up, and Matthew especially wants to paint him as that guy. He is that guy. That new Moses you've been waiting for, this is that guy, right? There are a number of different things that he does uh, in order to show this. One of them, usually we reference in chapter 1, is... Um, is uh, when he, or chapter 1 and chapter 2, he references, out of, out of Egypt I have called my son. Uh, and, and that's a really interesting study. But the one that I want to zero in on today is about the women in the genealogy of Jesus. So we're going we're gonna to read Matthew chapter 1, which is usually a punishment, but tonight is going to be the fundamental core of our study. So uh, Matthew chapter 1, we're going to read through these genealogies. As we read through, we'll go through verse uh, 17. So let's start Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob. Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez by, uh, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Akim and Akim, the father of Eliud, and Eliud, the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar, the father of uh, Mathan, and Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So, all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation of Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation of Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Couple of observations. That's hard to read. <laughs> now, as we read through, you may have noticed, I think I've, I've mentioned this before, as we read through, you may have recognized some names. Uh, some of the names that stood out. Zerubbabel. I remember Zerubbabel. He's, I remember reading about him after they were deported to Babylon. He was one of the guys that came back and wanted to rebuild Jerusalem. I remember that story. Uh, Josiah. Uh, jo we, we sang a song about Josiah. He was a king at eight years old. 
Um, Solomon, I remember Solomon, and I remember he had those two sons, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and, and they were the ones that split the kingdom. As you read through this genealogy, we read it and we think, he's probably not pronouncing those names right. That's what you all were thinking. Uh, or we think, man, this is repetitive, or this is difficult, or what's the point of this? For a Jew reading this genealogy, they are having flashbacks. Uh, it, it's, like, it's like that episode of, of your favorite TV show where the, it doesn't advance the plot and nothing happens, but it just references all the episodes that came before it, like the flashback episode. You all remember that. It was the one that you skipped. You're just like, oh, I remember that episode. You, you're, you're getting glimpses into the history of these people. You're getting a, a reference to, yeah, David by the wife of Uriah. Yeah, David. Uh, uh, you're getting glimpses into, into Ahaz. 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 Ooh, he was not great. Uh, you're reminded of, like we said, Josiah. Oh, Josiah, who, who, who brought the law back for Israel. Remember, he found Deuteronomy. Uh, you get little glimpses into the time in between. Uh, you remember Zadok. If, in verse 14, Azor was the father of Zadok. Zadok, was, uh, the, he's the namesake of the Sadducees. We, we, talk, we talked about that before. If you're a Jew, you know all of these names. You know all of these people. You know all of their stories. And every name is a feeling, okay? Every name is a, is a story that you are tied into. And so this is a way more important chapter to them than it feels like it is to us, although it's incredibly important to us as well. Another thing, completely side note, one time uh, me and my buddy were teaching second graders, which we were in high school. It was a terrible decision on someone's part to let us do that. But we were teaching second graders, and we said, hey, let's read this to them and see if they can answer questions. And a little girl actually actually got the question right, and we had to give her candy. So anyway, that was fun. Um, but a second thing about this genealogy is, if the objective is to paint Jesus as the Christ, which that word is the Messiah, the chosen one who has come, the anointed one, right? If the, if the purpose of this genealogy is to paint him as this powerful figure who's come to do and save the world, right? It's horrible. Like, this is not a great genealogy. It's, um, as a matter of fact, it's like there's some fudging of numbers in the genealogy to make 14, 14, 14 work, Okay. Uh, there's also these references to these stories that are less than savory. Also, in this culture, you don't put women in a genealogy. You just don't. In their thinking, it wasn't necessary. The name didn't come through them. They weren't a part of the lineage. It was important that you got all the men and their name down so that you could have your lineage. And so there are five times throughout this, this genealogy that Matthew intentionally goes out of his way to include a woman in the genealogy. We'll, we'll point back to him. The very first one is in verse 3. All right, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, by Tamar. Like, that didn't add anything. Similar to how we talked about Moses last week. His, uh, historiographers? Historians, there's the word. Historians, would uh, they would have written, and the more that the Hebrews were abused, the more they multiplied. And they would have left out the Hebrew midwives, right? Because history wasn't trying to tell that story, but God was. And so here you have Matthew including Tamar for what appears to be no reason at all. It doesn't help with the genealogy. In fact, paints it in kind of a worse light. Then you go a little bit further. In verse 5, Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab, which didn't really matter. Salmon fathered Boaz, and then Boaz fathered Obed. We could have just skipped right over that and not had any problems. Then right after, uh, right after Boaz, it says Boaz fathered Obed, well, he did that by Ruth right there, the very next genealogy. We didn't have to include Ruth at all, but he did. Okay, then you get down just right in the next one. They're all right here. These three are right here in a row. Uh, Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David the king, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. You're supposed to leave that out about kings. You're not supposed to bring up the king's dirty laundry in a, uh, in, in, in a genealogy. In fact, when kings write history, they only write about their victories. You ever notice that? Well, 
Matthew had something different in mind, I guess. And then, as you skip, how many is that? One, two, three, four. As you skip all the way down, you have a bunch of other names, and you get to Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. Once again, by a Jewish count, Joseph was Jesus' father, and that was who his lineage was through, and that's whose lineage was traced here. So no need to add Mary if you're just trying to give an accurate report. I don't think that's exactly what Matthew was doing. Like we said, he's trying to paint Jesus as the new Moses, especially here in these first chapters. And so, I mean, there are, there are countless parallels between Jesus and Moses. They were both born uh, during a time when children were being killed because there was a threat and the king ordered that all children under the certain age be killed. Moses was born in that time. Jesus was born in that time. They were both delivered from that. Both of them spent time in Egypt, but weren't meant to be in Egypt forever. Uh, there are a number of different, a number of different parallels. But this is another one. Uh, you think about the five women in the story: Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary. Similar to what we said last week, if these five women don't do what they did, Jesus gets here some other way, right? We don't have a shaky confidence in our God and his ability to get his son to earth for the purpose that he sent him here. But, but ultimately, these five women did do these things. They did live in the way they lived. They did make the choices they made. And because of that, Jesus came. And so these five women, similar to last week, these five women saved the world very similar to the seven women who saved the world and led to Moses. These five women saved the world and led to Jesus, which is awesome. Now, here's what we're going to do tonight, because we could make all of the same points as last week. I mean, uh, you know, God uses, uh, he, you know, does big things with little people. He, um, you know, he, uh, he, he values life in these, these situations can point to that as well. He's, he wants you to be in a position where he can use you, needs you to be ready because God's always wanting to partner with people. You know, just like last week, all those same lessons are here with these five women. But I think we can do something too, and that is ask what Matthew was doing, including these women in a genealogy. And if we answer that question, what I really think we're going to do tonight is we're going to see some things about who our God is Help us know him better. And if we know God better, then we know how to live better. Because if we can understand who God is and we can try to live like he would live if he was here on earth, which another way of saying that is live like Jesus lived, then we can uh, take that and apply that in our life and, and grow because of it and further the kingdom. So here's what we're going to do tonight. Uh, we're going to look at three things that this genealogy, I think, teaches us about who God is. And then we're going to... Uh, wrap it all up and, and, and bring it home, and uh, hopefully we will come away from this being closer to God because we know him better. Uh, so the first thing, and this definitely parallels last week pretty well, but the first thing is that God uses the insignificant. Now, in, in two ways this is true. God uses insignificant people, and he uses insignificant actions, Right? I mean, history does not have to tell us about Tamar, okay? I don't know. I, I, I joke and I say this is the forgotten chapter of Genesis because we don't ever read it to anybody. In fact, in preparing for this lesson, I gave thought to reading it, and then I read it, and I said, I'm not saying that from the pulpit, okay? Go read Genesis 38, and you'll get it. You'll understand exactly what I'm talking about, okay? This is a story where, where Judah, uh, one of the 12 sons of Israel, he leaves home, he, he goes out, and he's married, and he has children, and he has two sons, and one of his sons dies, and he leaves a wife, his sons are married, he leaves a wife, and so Judah tells his other son, hey, go have a child with your brother's wife so that you can continue his name. In their culture, that's what you do, that's, and then later when the law is given, that's even what's commanded in the law, keep your brother's name, so go have a child with your brother's wife, and that child will continue your brother's name, and Judah's other son was not down for that, so he did what he had to do to prevent that from happening. That's as blatant as I'm going to get tonight, go read it on your own. Then, because of that, it was said that that was wicked in the Lord's sight, and God struck his other son dead. And so Judah is like, I've got this third son, but he's too young to have a baby and, and fulfill that duty. So he tells Tamar, which was his daughter-in-law, he tells her, hey, 
when my younger son is old enough, he'll fulfill the responsibility and he'll give you a child in the name of uh, my middle son or my, my other son, okay? Well, the younger son grows up, Tamar can tell he's not actually going to fulfill his responsibility here. And the thought process for Judah was that could get my youngest son killed too. I don't want to take that chance. So Judah was just going to let Tamar be a single widowed woman for the rest of her life, which is a vulnerable position. It's, uh, her, her husband's name and his son's name wouldn't have been continued, which would have been very significant. And so he decides, I'm not going to let my youngest son, even though he's old enough at this point, I'm not going to let him have a child for his brother. So Tamar takes matters into, his own, into her own hands. Eventually, Judah is off somewhere. And while he's off, Tamar, <laughs> I, mean, I don't even want to tell you the whole story, okay? This is why we don't talk about it. Tamar dresses up like a prostitute, veils her face, and then seduces Judah. Well, it doesn't seem to take much in the story to do that, though. And when she's trying to secure payment, she says, what will you what are you going to pay me? He says, I'll give you a, a, young, a young goat. And she says, okay, well, how will I know you're going to do that? You need to give me something to uh, prove that you're going to give me payment later. And so he gives her his ring, and I think it's his ring and his staff. And she says, okay, cool. So then when he gets home, he sends the goat back. And uh, they can't find this prostitute anywhere. And he's like, well, whatever. My conscience is clean. I tried, right? And uh, which is, what a statement. So then, uh, you know, a couple months later, uh, Tamar is pregnant, and the people in his camp are like, hey, she needs to be stoned because she has prostituted herself out and gotten pregnant. And Judah's like, yeah, she does. And then she sends to Judah privately and says, hey, the baby is this man's. And she sends the ring and the staff to Judah, and Judah's response is, she is more righteous than I. That's the story of Judah and Tamar, Okay. The PG version. That was as PG as you can make it without, with giving all the details. Like, like, listen, Matthew, <laughs> why, why are you throwing Tamar in Jesus' genealogy? That's a very unpleasant story. I'm, I'm sweating up here just talking about it. And, and, and we don't even want to read the whole thing. Like, that's, that is uncomfortable. And yet Matthew includes that story. History did not have to record Tamar. They could have just recorded that that Judah fathered Perez and Zerah and left it right there. But Matthew chooses to include Tamar because God uses what the world may consider insignificant people. Maybe Tamar didn't matter in the history of Jesus' lineage, but, but Tamar mattered because she was a part of God's plan. Uh, another, another person in this genealogy, you've got uh, Ruth, who is, is mentioned as the father of Obed. Okay, so if you remember the story of Ruth, it's in the book of Ruth. Uh, if you remember that story, that Ruth was a Moabite woman, and her husband died, and so she followed her mother-in-law, Naomi, and that's that, that famous, that really well-known, your God will be my God, and I will go where you go, and I will stay where you stay, right? Like, this is the, the love story between Ruth and Naomi, and then the love story between Ruth and Boaz, and Boaz sees Ruth out in the field, and he loves her, but there's some legal stuff that he has to get around in order to marry her, and he chooses to marry her, and it's a beautiful story. The problem with the story here, here's the scandal, ready? All of the Jews are racists, and Ruth was a Moabite, okay? That's the problem. If you don't think the Jews are racist, go read Jonah, all right? He literally didn't want the Ninevites to live, okay? This is, this is the problem, is Ruth. Like, you're now including in the prophesied Messiah's lineage this insignificant foreigner, this Moabite woman who doesn't matter. In fact, if we just leave her out of it, it makes the Messiah look a little better. But Matthew included her because God uses what the world sees as insignificant people and insignificant actions. Sometimes these actions that, uh, that women take in these stories uh, are, are seen as insignificant. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but God uses the insignificant. And, and when I say God uses, I don't mean that God is like using people like we think of people using people, but God is willing to partner with, right? God is willing to work with and use people use insignificant people to accomplish his will, which is a beautiful thing, because when we think about it, how significant are we? So 
Second thing, God, that this uh, genealogy teaches us is that God uses broken people. God uses broken people to accomplish his will. Remember, these five women were in the lineage of Jesus. Each one of these five was used by God. Their story was told, and they got us to Jesus. They saved the world in that regard. And so uh, you think about Rahab. Okay, Rahab, uh, she was the father of, uh, the father of Boaz. So Rahab was a, well, I mean, again, this is not a very savory story. Rahab was a prostitute in Jericho. Okay, so as Israel came out of Egypt, and then they had that wandering in the wilderness with Moses as their leader, then Moses dies, Joshua becomes their leader, and then they start taking over places. I mean, taking over places. They go in to the promised land, they have that little hiccup in Ai, and then after Ai, or, or, or I'm sorry, they, they go into Jericho, and and they wipe Jericho out, right? Which, if history was telling us the story, that's all they'd have to say. God delivered his people and took over Jericho. But there's this little, little snippet in Joshua chapter 2 that tells us all about this prostitute named Rahab. Now, there's a lot of really cool stuff that, that in the story of Rahab that is uh, other places in Scripture that I think are really cool, but we're not going to dive into all of it. What we really need to look at is, why was Rahab a prostitute? Like, the Bible doesn't tell us, history doesn't tell us, but we know it can only be one of maybe three options. Her dad sold her when she was young. She chose to do it because she was a single woman and that was her ability to make way for herself. Or she was a horribly wicked person and that was her thing. Those are really our three options. There's probably a little bit of overlap, but what we know is that Rahab was not in an enviable position, okay? She was not in, a, in an enviable position. She was not in a position that someone dives in head first because they just love it. That's, that is not where you find that profession. That, I mean, Rahab had to have something in her life go wrong to put her in the position that she was in, more than likely. And so Rahab is is a prostitute who lives in the wall of Jericho. And when she sees these spies, she takes them in and says, hey, we're all terrified of your God. Like our hearts are melting within us, I believe is the language that, that she uses. And, and then she hides them in, uh, in the flax, which is interesting. And then she uh, makes a deal with them. And she's like, hey, um, when you guys show up, I'm going to put, you know, deliver me and my family. And they're like, okay, cool. Put a red cord out your window and we'll deliver you. And so They do the marching around Jericho, they blow the trumpets, all the walls fall down on the seventh day, and you can just, I mean, you can see these spies who take off, like they know which way that wall was, and they take off, and her house was in the walls, right? And the walls fell flat, except for Rahab's house. And so they take off, and they're running, and they're looking through the debris, and and then they see this little section of the wall that's standing up right there, and Rahab and her family are there. Rahab's also not a Jew, but she was brought into the family of Israel. She married a man. She married a man named, uh, named Salmon. Right? Rahab got married. She was redeemed. She got married and she fathered uh, Boaz. And then Boaz fathers Obed. And then Obed fathers Jesse. And then Jesse fathers David. What a beautiful, beautiful story to get all the way to David. Then you have this story of Bathsheba, right? The blight on David's tenure as, as king. He, he had this situation in 2 Samuel chapter 11 where he was supposed to be out in war. I mean, that detail in, in the Bible is so fascinating. It was the time of year when kings went out to war. David was at home. You see, he was not where he was supposed to be. So David was at home and he saw Uriah bathing on the roof and he calls her in or he calls a servant. He's like, hey, who's that? And they're like, did you know who that is? That's Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. Like, he's one of your mighty men, one of your closest allies in the throne. You know exactly who that is. Yeah, well, I'll call her in. Have her come. Have her come to me. And David commits adultery with Bathsheba and sends her on her way. She gets pregnant. He has to cover it up. He calls Uriah home. Uriah refuses to go uh, be with his wife for an evening. And then David says, well, I bet you can't have that kind of willpower when you're drunk. So they get drunk and Uriah has that kind of willpower when he's drunk. And then David's like, well, then the only thing to do is kill you. How can I do that without looking bad? 
take this letter to the captain of the army. The captain opens up the letter. Everyone step back from Uriah and let him get killed. Okay. And they do it, and Uriah dies. That's the story of Bathsheba. Now, the first child that David and Bathsheba had ends up dying. But their second child is Solomon, who was the next king and continues the lineage to Jesus. Matthew did not have to include that story. <laughs> like, that's the worst story he could have picked from David. And there's a lot of story about David in the Bible, but Matthew chose Bathsheba to highlight in this, in this, um, in this genealogy. I mean, if you were going to highlight the deliverer of the world, the chosen one who's going to save us all, wouldn't you highlight, uh, you know, and, and David fathered Solomon after he killed Goliath. Right? You would, like, you would like lean into one of those good parts of the story, but he doesn't. He leans into the part about, about Bathsheba because over and over and over and over again, God uses, partners with broken people to accomplish his will. He partners with people who are imperfect, regardless of what their situation was, whether it was their choice or whether it was something forced their hand or a combination of the two, because that's usually what it is. God partners with people who are broken. God partners with radically imperfect people who make massive mistakes. God partnered with David. I mean, I think this is more about David being broken than Bathsheba, right? The king says it, you're either going to die or do it. So that, she didn't even hardly have much. Talk about being an insignificant character. Bathsheba's hardly portrayed as a person in this story. She's just like a plot device, right? She didn't say anything throughout the whole story. And yet God uses Bathsheba to continue the lineage, to save the world, and get to Jesus. God uses David, a broken man who made a horrible, wicked choice, to continue the lineage, to save the world, to get to Jesus, to get to Jesus, to save the world. God uses the insignificant among us. God uses the broken people among us. And ultimately, God built a kingdom for outsiders. That's the third one. God built a kingdom for outsiders. Now, I, I don't think this is any more obvious than in the story of Mary, who is the fifth woman here in the genealogy of Jesus. All the way down in verse 16, Jacob was the father of Joseph, and Joseph the husband of Mary, whom, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So Mary, I mean, she's like, she's like nobody in the genealogy other than she was the mother of Jesus. Now, in the story, she becomes more significant, obviously, but in the genealogy, like, I mean, in the Jewish mind, Joseph was Jesus' father, period. That was it. But Mary, who is absolutely no one, is absolutely crucial to God's plan. Talk about God using the insignificant. Uh, talk about God using uh, maybe potentially broken people like, or, or using an outsider like we're, we're talking about in this third point. When, when Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant before they had gotten married... What was his plan? Well, his plan was to divorce her quietly, right? And uh, he was going to really, culturally, that means he was going to take the brunt of the, the public opinion, right? The people were going to be like, oh, what happened? Joseph, right? And that he was going to do his best to protect Mary, which I think if you, you look at it culturally, he was doing what he thought would have been best. She was pregnant before she got married in a culture where that was like, a curse to your social death, you know? Like, it wasn't just, hey, that's, ah, that's tough, you know? It, it, wasn't, it wasn't, hey, that's not okay, whatever. It wasn't, eh, everyone's doing it. It was, yeah, she's out of here. We're not going to have anything to do with that. And so, and so Mary, she, she became quickly an outsider through no fault of her own, right? She became quickly an outsider. And G, uh, Matthew, as he's, as he's going through this genealogy, you think about all of these women that he's included were serious outsiders. Uh, you, I mean, we, we already talked about um, how Rahab, or uh, yeah, Rahab and Ruth, like they weren't even Israelites. They were a different nationality entirely. And for this incredibly race-motivated group of uh, Jews that Matthew is writing to, that was significant. They were outside. You know, I'm sure you guys have heard Dad say this before. Roses are reddish, violets are bluish. If you're not Gentile, you must be Jewish. Like that's that was the thought process. There was only two categories. You're either in the Jewish crowd or you're not. 
and Matthew includes two women who were not. Then you've got the story of, of, of Tamar. I mean, how much more of an outsider could you be? You've had two husbands die on you, and then you've also, uh, you, you know, your father-in-law didn't want to do things the appropriate way, and then you had to sneak your way into it with what were less than comfortable circumstances, and then you had to, like, basically justify yourself by your trickery. I mean, that's, like, she'd be kicked out of the camp in a heartbeat after we read her story, right? Okay, then you've got, then you've got Bathsheba. I mean, very simply put, Bathsheba and David both committed adultery, although obviously I think the blame is going to fall on David, but Bathsheba committed adultery just as much as David did in, in some regards, and so you've got an adulterer who should be taken outside the camp and stoned, right? Well, God's built a kingdom for outsiders. And, and really, I think that's the whole point of Matthew's gospel. As he, as he goes through this, uh, this gospel, this account of Jesus, you think about what he says in Matthew chapter 5 at the beginning of his first sermon, what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5. He says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you, you, there's no way you're coming into the kingdom of heaven. Hold on. We thought they were the most righteous, and you're telling us we have to be more righteous than them? Or, or what about what he says in Matthew chapter 21, that, that the prostitutes and tax collectors will enter into the kingdom of God before you, talking to the Pharisees? That's completely backwards. I mean, it's almost like, hey, God built a kingdom for outsiders, not for insiders. God built a kingdom for people who are outside or who are, who are cast out of society. God built a kingdom for people who are, who are underserved, who are underprivileged, who are outcasts. And that's exactly who he built his kingdom for. Look at one more thing. Go to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53, which we all immediately go, hey, suffering servant, prophecy about Jesus. And I think it's a prophecy about Jesus in a really cool way when we think about this kingdom for outsiders and these characteristics of God. God uses the insignificant. God uses broken people, and God built a kingdom for outsiders. Isaiah 53 and verse, uh, verse 2 says, For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. Okay, so, so you're telling me Jesus was insignificant? Well, he wasn't beautiful? He wasn't majestic? There was nothing about him that made you go, yes, that guy. There was, he, wasn't, he wasn't significant, Right? Okay, so then, then you look at uh, uh, verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. So are you telling me he was despised and he was rejected? He was an outsider? Is that right? That's exactly right. Okay, surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. We said that guy is broken. That guy is, bro, he's, he is stricken by God, smitten by God, okay? But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. So, so Jesus was described in this prophecy as insignificant, broken, and an outsider. That is who our God is gravitates towards that is who our God chooses to partner with over and over and over again in the story of the Bible he chooses to partner with the insignificant among us he chooses to partner with broken people repeatedly and he chooses to build a kingdom that is not for all the people you think should be there but for exactly the people you think should not God has built a kingdom for outsiders and he partners with people who are broken and insignificant tell me do you want to be friends with that God? Well, you should, because if we're being reflective, I'm pretty insignificant in the grand scheme of things. I am definitely broken, and no one knows that better than me, and I am an outsider. Sometimes I'm too Christian for the world and too worldly for Christians. <laughs> so, boy, do I need a God who loves those kind of people. Amen. Think about this, too. If our deepest fear 
is people truly knowing us, which you may say, that's not my deepest fear. I hate snakes. And I would say I agree with you. But uh, when you think about it, really, one of our deepest fears as humans is people really knowing who we are, knowing everything about us. When you meet someone, you know, let's say you meet somebody, what do you do first? You exchange names and you talk about where you work and you get surface level. You might make some jokes or talk about TV shows. As you get to know someone and, and you know, maybe you have some more deep conversations and you talk about uh, your future plans, things you'd like to do, things you aspire to, good things, right? Maybe, maybe you get to know someone a little closer and you start opening up about things you struggled with, struggled in the past, of course, struggled with. Or, or maybe, maybe you get a little bit more honest. And you're like, oh, these are things I do struggle with. But you always start, you always start with the palatable ones, right? Um, you think about it. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm exposing myself here, but. I think even married couples don't tell each other everything for a couple of years, right? I mean, after you get married, you, you, you know, you got a couple of years where you're like, hey, she doesn't have to know that. He doesn't need to know about this. Because why? Because at the end of the day, we're a little bit afraid of someone really knowing who we are because we really know who we are and we know we're really not who we are. You know what I'm saying? So, so if one of our deepest fears is that someone will know our deepest, darkest secrets, or if, or if we would say the sentence, if you knew every thought I had, you'd hate me, if those are the things that we're afraid of in relationship, what if a person who had a track record like our God showed up and wanted to be our friend? Well, I'd take that in a heartbeat. You think about it. A, a friend like God is gossip-proof, right? No one's going to come up to God and say, have you heard about what Joseph did? Have you heard about the things he did when he was younger? God's going to say, yeah, I have. I know. I love him. I know him. I know everything about him. I, listen, you don't know how he treats these kind of people. He says, no, I do. I, I wish he didn't, but I love him. I'm going to work with him. I can do something with that. Are you kidding? This is who our God is. He is a God who uses the insignificant, partners with the broken, and built a kingdom for outsiders like us. The invitation tonight is very simple. You're invited to a relationship with this God. You're invited to be a partner with this God, to, to be close to this God who knows everything about you, has actually heard every thought that you have, and loves you every second of your life. Anyway, he knows everything. He knows you fully and wants to be with you. That's who our God is. That is one of the lessons you can learn from the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 and these five women that are highlighted in this genealogy. And so tonight, if you want to be a part of that relationship, that's what we offer this invitation for. Or if you need the prayers of the church, you can let us know and we'll pray with you and help you while we stand and sing.